Hi, my name's Rachel Robinson. I work for Museums Worcestershire as manager of the County Museum, Hartlepool Castle and the Commandery in Worcester. And today I'm going to talk to you about the potential ways that smaller museums and heritage sites can generate income. I think what's most effective and in many ways safer in terms of income generation is to create a range of income streams working in tandem. So I'm going to talk briefly about how museums can potentially increase their earned income in five ways. Admission fees, donations, retail, catering and venue hire. So, starting with admissions. Each organisation will be different in terms of their charging policy. Many will charge set prices for admissions, others will be doing admission by optional donation. Both of these are valid approaches. What I would say if you are charging for admission is to consider whether your current ticket options are covering all types of potential visitor and importantly are going to encourage repeat visiting, which can be beneficial to all of your various income streams. Most sites will have standard ticket options, such as adult, child and family tickets, maybe a concession option for over 60s or students, and free tickets for categories like under fives and carers. But in addition to the usual day tickets, you should consider offering season tickets or annual passes, which offer unlimited admission for a given time frame. Again, these can be categorised for different types of visitor, but you'll usually find they're most popular with families, particularly if your site offers regular children's activities and events or outdoor space for families to enjoy time and time again. In terms of pricing, you may want to consider pricing your pass just under the cost of two single day tickets, so that when promoting your pass you can say you'll be saving money by your second visit, or somewhere between the cost of two and three visits, so that you can say if you plan to come more than twice it will save you money. Passes priced at the cost of three visits or more are unlikely to sell. You should also consider offering gift passes, which can be purchased and gifted to family and friends, and do additional promotion on these in the lead into Christmas. Make sure your season ticket advertising clearly states what is and isn't included, and put in place a robust system of record keeping and a renewals procedure which ensures pass holders are contacted before their pass expires and encouraged to renew. The additional and important financial bonus to selling season tickets is that often the visitors who come to you again and again will spend money in your shop or cafe or pay for extra activities each time they visit. Pass holders often bring paying family and friends to visit with them and can help spread the word about what a great time they have at your site, encouraging others to visit and thus increasing your general admissions income. Additional income can also be made at the admissions point through extra chargeable activities and providing the price is reasonable visitors are often happy to pay a little extra to enhance their visit. Examples include optional children's craft activities during school holidays and seasonal additions such as pumpkin carving or Santa's Grotto, family trails or hireable explorer backpacks for families, hireable audio guides and of course your admissions point is also where you can charge for your guidebook or any other printed information but more about that later. Special event days can also help to boost your admissions income. So consider holding events linked to key times of year like Christmas and Easter or on bank holidays. Events can be aimed at visitors with a general interest in your subject matter, such as our popular Living History Days at the Commandery, or aimed at key audience segments. For example, our Pirates or Knights and Princesses Days at Hartlepool Castle are clearly aimed at families. You should also consider ticketed events. These could be for large numbers of people, such as an evening music performance or a theatre event, or for smaller numbers, such as a specialist talk or a behind-the-scenes guided tour. They can happen inside your normal hours or after hours. A varied events programme can bring visitors back time and time again, so it's worth trying to build this area up if you don't already do this. Give thought to your current visitor profile and what may interest them, as well as the space and budget that you have to use and be sure to carefully calculate all the costs of running an event before deciding whether or not to include it in your programme. All museums and heritage organisations should encourage supporters to donate, whether that be instead of or in addition to a set admission charge. So here are my top tips for encouraging donations. Make the donation boxes visible. Ensure they are on the main visitor route and in an uncluttered area. Sites which don't charge admission should definitely have a donation box at the entrance with a suggested donation amount, but really all museums and heritage sites should consider locating a donations point within the museum, either towards the end of the visitor route 
when visitors have seen the full extent of your offer, or after a particularly special part of your site or your most impressive exhibition. It's often useful to experiment with locations, so move the box around occasionally and see which position on your particular site is the most effective. The most successful cash donation boxes are clear perspex so that people can see that others have been donating. For this reason you should start all donation boxes off with a float showing an encouraging range of coins and a few notes. Empty the boxes regularly but always leave the float. Boxes should obviously be locked and are often fitted to a freestanding plinth which makes them harder for someone to attempt to remove. The messages around your box should be clear about why you need donations and what the money will be going towards and should definitely include a thank you. This could be a general appeal for donations to help your museum to continue its work or maybe a more successfully linked to a particular project. For example, you might have an object you want to conserve, a hole in the roof you're trying to fix or you might be planning to purchase something to enhance the visitor experience. Bear in mind that if you state donations are going to be used for a particular project, you must make sure that they are but being specific can result in higher levels of donations from visitors who can see a clear benefit to them giving you the cash. The more fun ways of donating, which often rely on children asking their parents for a coin, can provide a steady, although usually low level source of donations too. For example, using a coin drop style donation box in a more family orientated area of your site. Or as another example, we have a working model of a Victorian fairground carousel which visitors pay just 20p to activate. It is often in use and much loved by visitors, leading to a small but consistent stream of income for us. Bear in mind too that there are also ways to donate digitally now. Some schemes can be set up on your website at very little cost and linked to QR codes around your site. And there are also text to donate schemes, which are very easy for visitors to use. Bear in mind too that there are also ways to donate digitally now. Some schemes can be set up on your website at very little cost and linked to QR codes around your site. And there are also text to donate schemes, which are very easy for visitors to use. A growing number of sites are also utilising contactless payment points for donations. But there are regular charges with these that may mean it's not a viable option for sites with low visitor numbers. So if this is something you are considering doing, ensure you've fully investigated the ongoing costs. Charities should also explore the options for claiming gift aid on donations, including the Gift Aid Small Donation Scheme, where gift aid can be claimed on small amounts without you needing to collect donors' details. Now, moving on to retail. Many visitors to heritage sites are actively looking to buy something, be it a souvenir of their visit, a treat for themselves or a gift for others. But for small to medium-sized museums, it probably won't be financially viable to employ a member of staff solely to run a small shop. If, however, you already employ a member of staff to welcome visitors and take admissions, then expanding that space to include a shop can generate an additional source of income. And of course, if your shop area is volunteer run, the profit levels are even higher. Accepted wisdom is that shops located at the end of the visitor journey work well, but happily many smaller museums have a single point of entrance and exit, so one member of staff can still fulfill both functions. Ideally, your shop would be visible from outside of the building and should be able to be accessed by potential purchasers without them needing to pay admission. One of the most important aspects to bear in mind when creating a shop area is that the look and feel of the space and the staff and volunteer engagement that takes place there must be of equal quality to the rest of your museum. Customer care training is key and training in merchandising and upselling can also be very effective. The quality of the display units also matter and you should avoid utilising mismatched units or old exhibition cases. Aim to find enough initial investment to purchase good quality display units if you can, ideally with integrated lighting, adjustable shelves and cupboard space at the bottom for stock storage. And in terms of the physical layout of your shop, if you do have school visits, it might be worth considering locating the pocket money priced items in a position where children can gather around without being disruptive to other shoppers and obviously at child height. You will also need to invest in sufficient stock levels from the outset to ensure your shelves don't look sparsely filled. So even in a small area, you will need at least a few thousand pounds for initial stock. A range of retail price points is important 
but it may be helpful to limit yourself to an upper retail price point, for example ours is around £25, that you don't go over without due consideration. At the other end of the scale, if you have family or school visitors, then it's important to have a good range of pocket money priced items. In general, if your pricing is correct, your gross profit, that is the difference between the cost and the selling price of an item, should be around 50% of the selling price for most gift lines, but will be more like 35% for books and some food items. Getting your numbers right can make or break a retail outlet, so it's important that the person in charge of your shop understands pricing calculations and terms like gross and net profit, markup and margins, all of which is too complex for me to go into in this short film, but you'll find plenty of information online. Depending on your budget, you may be able to invest in an electronic till, an EPOS system, which will keep accurate records of your sales and stock levels. If you can't afford a full system, then manual systems can also work, but you must put robust procedures in place at the till point to ensure that you are recording the different amounts taken for both vattable and non vattable items. Branded and bespoke items can be worth the initial investment, as some visitors are very keen to take home a souvenir, but it's worth shopping around to find a supplier who will allow you to start off with smaller orders, and these sorts of items should only ever constitute a small amount of your overall stock. If you prefer not to invest in bespoke items, then finding items that you can buy from wholesale suppliers which link to your museum collections is an equally good way to start. For example, we stocked woolly mammoth toys during our recent Ice Age exhibition at the Art Gallery, and we always stocked some Civil War related items at the Commandery Shop. But again, these should be included within a broader range of items more typically found in general gift shops, such as greeting cards, toys, books, jewellery, and things to use in the home or garden. Books and food items inevitably have a lower profit margin, but often still sell in large enough numbers to make them a viable addition to your stock. Foodstuffs in particular can be popular, although again, my note of caution is to bear in mind sell-by dates and potential wastage, so I would advise starting with a small range and seeing how it goes. You may be able to link up with local food suppliers, which often means you can purchase smaller amounts more frequently, and a local independent range of food items is often very appealing to the visitor. You may also find small local suppliers offering items like greeting cards, handmade gifts, or independently produced books. One of the benefits of suppliers like this is they may be willing to work on a sale or return basis. This means that you take an amount of stock without having to pay up front. After an agreed length of time, if sales have been good, you can pay for what you have had and order more. If sales have been poor, you can hand the remaining items back and only pay for those you have sold. This can be a good way of smaller organisations expanding their product range without a large outlay. But do make sure to keep written records of what the agreed terms are, including the amount of stock taken, an agreed price and a date for reviewing it. In terms of merchandising, or how you display the items, it helps to group similar items together. So have defined areas of your shop for ranges such as books, food or jewellery. Ensure your displays are eye-catching and inviting, especially the shelves at eye level, but are not so perfect that the customer feels uncomfortable picking items up. Ensure everything is clearly priced and pay particular attention to what you place near the till, where you'll get some impulse purchasing. So keep these items relatively low cost, but appealing as a pickup. Maybe some confectionery, inexpensive gifts, or an item which you want to sell in large numbers, for example, a guidebook. I just want to talk briefly about guidebooks. A guidebook is one of the most commonly sold items at museums and heritage sites. It is often the thing the visitors are looking to buy, and if you can afford the initial outlay to have a professional guidebook produced, then in time it can generate a great profit. There is no doubt that it is a considerable financial investment, and you'll need to give some thought to your visitor numbers and how many you think you would sell. To give you an example of costs, you might be looking at around £5,000 for design and an initial print run of maybe 2,000 books. So at a retail price of £5, you should be able to double your initial investment. Assuming you don't need to make any amendments, a second print run could be closer to a pound per unit, so your profit margin then increases. My advice would be to work with an experienced guidebook producer and make sure you are using high quality photographs. I'd also recommend covering the history of the site, interesting stories and key objects as opposed to a walkthrough of the museum rooms, which should stop your guidebook going out of date when things change. 
display your guidebook next to the till and offer it to every visitor. My final tips on retail are, know your numbers, set yourself spending limits on stock and monthly sales targets, and be sure to monitor these against actual performance. Know your visitor. When choosing stock, keep in mind who your typical visitors are. Don't just buy things that you like for yourself. And before you place your orders, make sure you're happy with the retail price you will need to charge on an item and that you know how you're going to display it. If items are slow to sell, try moving them to a different position in the shop. And if that makes no difference, then reducing those items to a price that they will sell at is much better than carrying dead stock. If you are a charity, ensure you fully understand your VAT position. You may need to open a trading arm if that's appropriate for your organisation. Consider also paying for the advice of a professional retail consultant, particularly one with experience in heritage and museums. Moving on now to catering. Cafes are often a very important part of many museums and heritage sites. They enhance the customer's visit and provide additional income for the museum. Some develop a strong customer base of their own, who are all potential converts to the museum or purchasers for your shop. Museum cafes come in all shapes and sizes, but for the purposes of this film, I'll just be concentrating on small, coffee shop style cafes. If you are thinking of adding a catering option to your museum, careful consideration must be given to the size and type that you go for and the best financial model. It can be difficult to make profit with a fully staffed cafe unless your visitor numbers are particularly high. So consider whether you will be able to create the type of offer you desire with just one member of staff. Of course, if you are a volunteer of an organisation, then you won't have the expense of staffing. But keep in mind the importance of ensuring consistency in the quality of product and service if a group of people are involved. You may also want to consider contracting out your cafe to an experienced operator, in which case your income will usually be in the form of a rental for the space or a percentage share of their profits. Just like the museum shop, a museum cafe should operate to the same high standards as the rest of the site, should ideally be visible from the outside and should be usable without having to pay to enter. A choice of outdoor and indoor seating can also be a draw. Unlike the shop, a cafe can get away with a much more quirky and fun appearance and certainly at the moment, mismatched furniture and vintage styles are popular options. Ensure your furniture is comfortable, functional and easy to keep clean. The menu is extremely important. In the beginning, it will pay to keep it simple. If good coffee and cakes are all you can manage right now, then that's a great start. If you are keen to offer more, then a simple menu of hot and cold sandwiches, soup, maybe jacket potatoes and the occasional seasonal specials should suffice and won't require you to install a full kitchen. Simple afternoon teas can be popular and of course you'll need to consider options for vegetarian, vegan, gluten free etc and definitely provide some options for children. If you can, a separate children's menu and a child friendly area with some toys and games would be popular with families. Repeat customers can be encouraged with occasional changes to the menu, loyalty scheme incentives like a free piece of cake after your 10th coffee, and a social media presence to keep reminding people what fantastic products your cafe serves. Set yourself monthly income targets and monitor performance carefully. As a rule of thumb, around 25% of your takings should be profit when all costs have been taken into account. Although you may be content to operate on a lower profit margin than this, if you feel your cafe is enhancing the visitor experience or attracting more people to the museum. Consider all the legal and health and safety requirements of opening a cafe before you begin. You will need to register the food premises with the local council, arrange hygiene training for staff and ensure they understand the allergen contents of your food, ensure all food safety processes are in place, including temperature checks, record keeping and cleaning regimes, your fire risk assessment will need to be reviewed and you may need to inform your insurers. Other licenses are also required if you intend to serve alcohol. Finally, if a small cafe is still more than you feel able to do right now, then consider creating a small seating area and invest in a self-service coffee machine. For around £100 you can now purchase machines that produce an acceptable standard of hot drink, which can then be coupled with bought-in cakes, crisps and biscuits from a food wholesaler. 
An honesty box can work if you are unable to locate your coffee area somewhere a member of staff can be present. And although it won't turn a huge profit, it should meet the needs of those visitors looking for a drink or snack and ensure they stay on site longer. There are some further links to more information about catering in museums in our online toolkit. And if this is your first steps into catering, you should consider contracting the services of a specialist catering consultant for some initial advice. Finally, I just want to talk briefly about room hire. Even in smaller museums and heritage sites, there are likely to be rooms that you could consider hiring out. And a unique, quirky space inside an interesting building can be very appealing to people looking for spaces to hire. You may also find that people coming to your venue for a function or meeting discover your museum for the first time and return as a visitor, thus boosting your general admissions income. Being a venue for local groups to meet can also raise your profile with potential supporters or future partners. Weddings are obviously one of the key categories here, but if you don't want to become a registered wedding venue, you can still consider providing a hireable space for wedding receptions. And more frequently these days, couples are happy to pay a fee just to take their photos in an interesting venue, which is a very quick and logistically simple thing for heritage sites to offer. You could also consider hosting team away days, product launches or hiring your venue as a filming location. One of the easiest and quickest ways to try out venue hire may be to consider if there's demand in your local area for hiring space for meetings or to deliver training or workshops. If you have a room that's not part of the visitor route and could be hired out for this purpose, then it will be a much simpler setup than a wedding and commonly happens during your normal opening hours, which should mean you don't need to pay for any staff overtime and can keep the hiring charges competitively low while still making a good profit. Organisations or individuals looking to hire a space will expect the room to be clean and presentable and the furniture of good quality. These days Wi-Fi is also high on most people's lists, so consider investing in Wi-Fi or be clear from the outset that you don't offer that at present. Have a price structure for your rooms and be sure you have calculated all your costs, including staff time to set up a room and clean up afterwards. Consider how much these prices need to increase if the request is for outside of your normal staffed hours and whether you want to offer discounts for registered charities, organisations that you work with or for someone wanting a regular booking. You should take deposits at the time of booking and the remaining payment shortly before the hire takes place. You can also offer optional extras such as a small fee to hire equipment like a flip chart or a projector and of course if you're able to offer refreshments or lunch then these can generate further profit for you too. Consider the various legal requirements. You will need to revisit your fire risk assessment and ensure you know the maximum number of people you can safely have in each room. You may need to revise your evacuation procedures. You may need to inform your insurance of your new venture. You'll need to ensure you're complying with the terms of your premises license. And of course, if you're branching out into weddings, there are other licenses that must be sought too. You will need to put together booking forms, contracts and conditions of hire documents. If you are in a historic building, there are many other things to consider, particularly for weddings. For example, you may need to ban the use of naked flames, certain types of confetti, dry ice, etc. Maybe even stiletto heels or red wine. You'll need to be clear if smoking isn't permitted and you'll need to ensure the hirer understands where they can and can't put up decor or signage. And of course, you'll need to consider the security of any collection items which might be within the hireable spaces and make sure that during hires, people cannot physically get to areas of the building they shouldn't be in. Put all the information about your hireable spaces onto your website, including some pictures of the rooms set up for different uses. And be sure to mention your new offer on your social media. The local press may be willing to cover the story of your new venture and you should also investigate any opportunities to promote your new offer through the local Chamber of Commerce, Business Improvement District and other local tourism organisations or venue hire websites. So, that was a brief outline of just some of the ways that small to medium sized museums and heritage sites can potentially generate income. As I said in the beginning, your aim should really be to have a range of income streams in place, but for smaller museums it's also very important not to spread your staff or budgets too thinly. So my final piece of advice would be to start small in one area and build slowly. Small changes can make a big difference. Do take a look at our online toolkit for more information and good luck with whatever you choose to do.